All right, hello everybody. Um, so today's speaker is Susan Nozel, Nozel? <laughs> who is the only speaker that has brought her own biscuits, by the way. <laughs> and, um, this is being recorded and webcasted, so, well, doesn't make any difference, except for the fact that she just found out a minute ago. <laughs> She's not very happy. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction that she gave to me so that you all know a little bit more about her. So, okay, so Susan works at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as a scientist and as director of the Physics Learning Center. Her research interests include applying optical spectroscopy, atomic physics, and atmospheric models to studies of solar terrestrial interac interactions, natural variability, and climate change. Um, she's also a member of the ExoCube CubeSat science team um, and the Physics Learning Center um, trains undergraduate peer mentors tutors to facilitate supportive learning teams <laughs> Sorry, um, for students studying introductory physics with an emphasis on providing a supportive learning environment for students who may feel a bit more isolated. Um, Susan is also interested in public outreach uh, with an emphasis on climate change and edu education. So I'll just leave you with her. She wants this to be informal, so I guess feel free to ask questions and to interact with her during the talk and yep thank you so much yeah okay okay thank you so much and thanks for the opportunity to be here again and um thank you especially to Li Ying my um hostess <laughs> host uh -huh. so today I wanted to um um to talk about um hydrogen response to solar cyclic variability and greenhouse gases from um, both observational perspective and also um, modeling perspective. And actually, I guess the way I put this talk together was um, in part to try to um, mention some things that we're working on now um, during this visit and um, also some additional um, work, the context for this work. Um, um, and after the meeting this morning, the AIM meeting this morning, I added some more information about the observational technique and then some of the forward modeling um, work, um, just because it sounded like people might be interested in those topics. So to, I'll talk a, a little bit about the um, hydrogen species budgets and coupling, um, so a little bit of overview, and then um, observational technique. Um, the work that we're doing on reanalysis of a longer term mid latitude hydrogen emission data set in order to um, improve its accuracy and to be able to um, link older observations with newer observations to better understand possible long term changes. Um, then also talk about um, solar cycle and climate sensitivity studies with the um, NCAR global mean model, which is the single column version of the time GCM model. And then also for a, a, a way to try to link observations with models by using a forward model technique that um, utilizes a code that our, our late colleague James Bishop um, wrote, which is a radio transfer code that um, extend, um, that's used to calculate intensities that would be observed from the ground or from space. And um, this forward modeling um, also uses an uh, analytic exospheric model that he wrote that um, extends a thermosphere into the exosphere. So I'll talk a little bit about the model and then some conclusions and future work. And please ask questions or tell me if there's some like changes that you see or, or things that um, we should take into account. Okay, so first, um, um, and also really happy that Gary Thomas has come. Thank you so much, because you can also be talk about part of this coupling process. But this is the coupling of hydrogen, um, hydrogen containing species. Just a little overview that um, in the um, um, one of the sources for hydrogen containing species in the middle and upper atmosphere is methane. Um, um, and methane is one of the anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Most important greenhouse gases here are some of the, the sources. And uh, mu much of water vapor in the lower atmosphere, tropospheric water vapor, is frozen out at the cold top of the tropopause. Um, sorry, the cold, trop cold tropopause, um, although some water vapor does make it into the stratosphere via very energetic um, storms. 
but because much of the water vapor is frozen out and remains in the troposphere, methane becomes an important source of, um, and a major source of hydrogen water vapor and other hydrogen containing species in the middle and upper atmosphere. And Gary's work has focused on studies of noctilucent clouds and long-term studies of noctilucent clouds in the mesosphere, which is also a, a, an area of study for trying to understand changes in hydrogen budgets and possible changes with um, climate in the middle atmosphere. So methane gets broken down into water vapor, H2, um, and other hydrogen-containing hydrogen species via chemistry and photolysis reactions. And then in the uppermost region, atomic hydrogen becomes in increasingly dominant with altitude. Now, one question I have is like whether um, these upper atmosphere observations and modeling can be used together with um, observations in the middle and lower atmosphere to help us have a better picture of what's happening to um, the hydrogen budgets. Oh, let's see, figure four. Oh, yes. So this, sure. This is um, this is the glow of hydrogen. Um, I think this is a Lyman alpha glow of hydrogen. So this is what you might call the geo corona. So the um, so so the hydrogen emission. Thank you for the question. Hydrogen emissions are um, a solar site excited emission, um, and this is the glowing hydrogen in the exosphere. I believe so. I believe. Oh, wait, from the moon? Actually, um, this one, I think, was. Um, yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Apollo 16. The no. Yes, and I think you're right. This was taken from the moon. Right. Thanks. There, um, as I understand it, then this is not my area of expertise, but as I understand that there's a number of um, sort of unresolved questions relating to hydrogen budgets at different altitudes. Um, one is that um, um, methane, sorry, methane um, has remained, um, th th sorry, the increases in methane concentrations that have been observed in the troposphere seem, my understanding of the reading at least, is that um, the methane um, observed, uh, concentrations are flatter than would have been expected from inventories of methane. So maybe one unresolved question is, so why would there be these relatively flatter methane um, concentrations um, compared with the inventories, but the increases in inventories? Oops. And another is, um, these are some stratospheric water vapor measurements. Um, these are um, balloon measurements from observations from balloons um, in the stratosphere uh, made from boulder. And my understanding, too, here is that the increases that have been observed are larger than would be expected from methane increases alone. Okay, so this is our long term data set. And it, my long term is actually short term, but for in the upper atmosphere, this is relatively long term. I mean, short term, of course, compared to other parts of the atmosphere. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but um, all of these. Um, all of these um, points actually represent multiple measurements. And I'll speak about how those measurements are made and how those um, data are put together. Um, and the, this dotted line is here to now still, still indicate that to this point, we've treated these data sets as um, sort of two separate data sets. They're taken with very similar instruments. However, um, um, when looking for long-term changes, one has to be that there, there's a lot of factors that need to be considered to make sure that the calibration or the analysis um, or the instrumentation or observational process is not what's counting, accounting for the longer term change or contributing to longer term change. So we're now involved in a reanalysis of the older observations to try to reduce uncertainties and, and link, better link the observations with one another. However, um, initial estimates of these uncertainties would indicate that um, we can't account for the upward trend by like sort of back of the envelope calculations about potential sources of uncertainties and um, and if this trend persists after the reanalysis it would be larger than would be anticipated from um, the modeling of 
sorry, suggestions from the modeling for what one might expect over this time period. Um, so just a little bit, I'll talk more about those data in a moment, but just a little bit about um, the instrumentation. These are um, data were taken with a ground-based Fabry Pro spectrometer, which is very um, high resolution, high throughput instrument that can look at very, um, very, very faint light, but at high resolution. And um, the observations are um, solar excited. So, uh, sorry, the emissions are solar excited. So it means to first order, you can use the Earth's shadow to determine the base of the column of emissions that one is observing. So this is, this is a column emission. So you're collecting photons along a column of altitudes. And um, when looking at, uh, so, so this is the, um, the uh, this line is, um, that we're looking at has been, uh, is excited by solar Lyman beta, and um, we one, one one outstanding challenge is trying to um, identify if there are any additional very high resolution Lyman beta measurements that could um, help to constrain models because it's the line center portion of the Lyman beta line that excites the emission. So I, my understanding is that there aren't many high resolution measurements of these Lyman lines, but I'm, I may be wrong, so I would love feedback um, if you have more ideas. I know that there were some from the SOHO mission, I think, that um, could be used for this purpose. So um, anyway, um, so by looking at different, um, di different uh, directions or, different, or in the same direction but different times of night, you'll be probing different shadow altitudes. So most of the emissions, again, are coming from above the Earth's shadow, but um, there will be some emissions, um, uh, multiple scattering below the Earth's shadow. So that also has to be taken into account. And please ask questions if you have them or if this is confusing, too. OK, and then a little bit about calibration, because um, for the long-term data set, of course, calibration is really important. So all of these observations were calibrated using astronomical nebula. Nebula, and these nebula have also been used for um, a number of different scientific fields, um, for for planetary studies and um, galactic emissions. So there's um, consistency, self consistency with these um, galactic calibrations, and and part of the purpose of the galactic calibration is that you have a candle out in the sky that's outside of your instruments. So the candle, so the um, the instrument will see the photons from the um, nebula source in a similar way that it would see the photons from um, the actual atmospheric source. And this is just a very a small subset of the observations that um, I have shown before. Um, these were taken from by an instrument called the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper Fabry Perot, which um, was is primarily as um, an astronomical instrument. It's a very um, high precision, um, high sensitivity instrument that uses what uh, new technology, annular summing technology, um, CCD annular summing technology. And these are observations that were taken before WAM was moved to the southern hemisphere to make an all sky map of the southern part of the galactic emission. So this is when the instrument was in the northern hemisphere. In, um, Kitt Peak, Arizona, and these are only a very small subset of the observations, but these are observations in very go low galactic emission regions of the sky, um, pointed in those regions so that we can try to reduce that source of uncertainty by avoiding the galaxy. Um, and um, they were taken on only the most exceptional little nights of viewing quality. So, um, and. Um, they represent about 25 nights of observations, and there's about a 10% uncertainty in um, comparing observations from one year with another. Um, but the point here is that these figures are a little bit hard to interpret sometimes. These are intensity versus um, shadow height. Um, but that um, they, we do see um, a statistically significant solar cycle variation with higher intensities during solar maximum than during solar minimum periods of time. Yes, please. Is there a lower limit to galactic emission? Mm -hmm. You mean like where, depending on where you're looking? Yeah, yes, there is. Um, there, um, these were taken, I think, with uh, like point less than about 0.2 Rayleigh's. 
submission. Um, so um, I will actually show that in a moment. Um, this is um, a map of the galactic emission across the sky. And so there are particular regions that might have, there are particular regions that have um, less, that, um, have, um, that produce less emission than others. D does that address your question a little bit? Yeah, Oh, okay. So you mean, you mean um, broad, diffuse? Yeah, there. Um, um, see. So usually, um, as you go to higher shadow altitudes, the um, intensity levels off, and um, that leveling off is my understanding would be that's due to multiple scattering in the lower atmosphere, but also a diffuse background. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well, the the um, the oh, the multiple scattering or the no. oh, galactic emission. So the galactic emission, if you look at particular, there are parts of the sky like these measurements were taken where where you would look and the um, intensity would be a fraction of a Rayleigh, about a quarter of a Rayleigh or less. Mm -hmm. Um, it um, it can influence your influence the results, but it minimizes the influence of galactic emission. So there's still uncertainty due to the galactic emission, but less than um, if you were. Um, let's see, um, there are um, there are some uh, measurements where you have the galaxy and the atmosphere at this. And here there is there sufficiently separated that you could fit both of them, but the uncertainty would be larger in terms of um, the retrieval of the, um, sorry, the atmospheric line and then the galactic line. So I would say that the galact for these very um, low galactic emission regions of the sky, the uncertainty due to the galaxy would be less than uncertainties due to other factors like tropospheric scattering or um, um, Calibration. Um, so these are um, so in the long-term data set. There's some of the observations are from Wisconsin, and some are from Kitt Peak, Arizona. Arizona. So that also provides introduces some uncertainty. But um, the um, the exosphere is is uh, more uniform or more larger scales in the at that altitude, but these were observations taken um, during the same dark of the moon period from Arizona and from um, Wisconsin, and they show um, pretty close agreement with one another. Okay, um, so um, as I mentioned, these are obs these are obs these are the um, observations taken with the the WAM instrument the um, the higher sensitivity instrument, and they show statistically significant solar cycle variation that is um, corro that's corroborated by the suggestion of a solar cycle observation in the older observations. And there's a suggestion of an upward trend, but to um, really confirm whether that's really there, um, we're involved now in um, a reanalysis of the older observations, and I'll explain a little bit about how we're how we're approaching that reanalysis. And these are all solar maximum points. And it may be, um, and this might be a modeling question to try to address, it may be that the intensity might be a little bit brighter at a, um, depending on the strength of the solar maximum. But I don't, my sense would be that it probably wouldn't account for that much of a change. Okay, and this is just to show some of the older observations um, that the signal to noise is still pretty, um, pretty good signal to noise. And um, the way we're trying, we're approaching reanalysis of the pre-1995 observations is um, to use updated information about the galactic emission that's been acquired um, by the astronomers, um, um, use of current analysis tools, and um, development and use of an updated tropospheric scattering correction code. And what this is is. Um, this means this is really important for um, many types of optical measurements. So what what happens is that um, if 
you're looking at a line of sight emission, you're looking at a column of emissions. Some of that emission is going to be, um, there's going to be extinction along the line of sight because you have absorption by, um, absorption by molecules or atoms along the line of sight and also, and in this case, the absorption is likely due to a little bit of absorption by ozone. Um, and then you can also have scattering out of your line of sight. So that's how you can have extinction. And extinction can be measured by um, cracking an object across the sky, like an astronomical nebula across the sky. And then you can actually, by looking at the intensity and looking at the various um, different zenith angles and using Beer's law, you can um, retrieve an atmospheric extinction. But um, the other issue that complicates the measurements is that you have scattering into the line of sight when you have this diffuse source across your sky. And that's been a challenging problem to address. Um, so this, um, um, my colleague Carrie Woodward from UW Fond du Lac and um, along with our group and um, our a colleague from atmospheric sciences, Grant Petty, are, um, have been modifying a code that Grant has written for the lower atmospheric radiator transfer to um, be able to better predict the tropospheric scattering. And that tropospheric scattering can be appreciable. It can be up to 10% of the emission. Um, we've taken that into account for the more recent measurements by and those that I showed you, just comparing observations from the same view, like viewing geometries. And so that minimizes that uncertainty. Hope I'm not getting into too many details now. Maybe I am. But um, anyway, that's one aspect of a code that we're working on. We're now uh, um, involved in trying to use um, lower atmospheric databases, absorption databases, to put that part into this code. The rest, I think, has been developed, but trying to better understand lower atmospheric absorption properties. And then review of the calibration. So that's the work that we're involved with now with the reanalysis. So that's the observational side. And then I was going to move on to the modeling now, unless there are any questions. Oh, actually, yeah. So I was just showing this. We just talked about the galactic emission, so that's one of the factors that are very important for reanalysis. Okay, so this is work that um, I'm working on with Li Ying and Alan and Stan and Wenbin primarily, um, but um, Art and Han Lee have also helped with some of the discussions. Um, so this is work to try to understand some of the mechanisms relating to um, solar cycle and greenhouse gases and how they uh, might be affecting hydrogen distributions. Um, in the upper atmosphere, middle and upper atmosphere. And this is an extension of work by um, Ray Robel. So the Robel and Dickinson seminal studies from the 1989 where they doubled um, um, carbon dioxide and methane at the lower boundary of the global average model, with, uh, again, the global average one-dimensional um, version of the Times GCM. Um, and they, their studies indicated that the middle and upper atmosphere were expected to respond to um, changes in greenhouse gases as um, also is the lower atmosphere. Um, so in the upper atmosphere, um, we're expected to have um, changes in composition as well as um, upper atmosphere cooling. So um, in terms of hydrogen, they predicted that hydrogen would increase by about 50% in response to doubling of carbon dioxide and methane. And so now what we're doing is we're trying to um, more, uh, we're trying to extend this work by um, using an updated um, version of the NCAR model, global mean model, and trying to address the question of uh, um, what role does carbon dioxide versus methane play, and is there a solar cycle um, change in terms of the greenhouse gas response? So is it methane or is it carbon dioxide, a combination of both gases that's affecting the hydrogen at, at higher altitudes? So this is, um, I should say, that here's, um, here's, this is a study in which we um, doubled carbon dioxide and methane at the lower boundary of the global mean model because that's what um, Ray and, and um, Ray Robel and Dickinson um, did for their study. So we doubled carbon dioxide and methane, and this is solar minimum case and solar maximum. And we can see that through the lower thermosphere, or through the mesosphere and then just into the lower thermosphere, there's not much um, solar cycle 
dependence in terms of the response. Let me just say here, this is altitude and this is percent difference. So by density percent difference, what we did here is we take um, the doubling case and then we compare it to the um, base case and then divide by the base case. So this is how we're calculating a um, percent change. And that um, there's a greater response at solar minimum than at maximum. And um, also, Liying, with your studies of the thermospheric density, total density response, also found larger response at minimum than maximum. Can you just set that minimum at um, um, Oh, uh, let's see. Right there. Um, um, I'm not sure if I can yet. But I, well, I think I can make a. a a thought, a suggest, a thought, and see what people think about. It. I think it's, um, I think it may have to do with temperature, but, but, um, but I'm not sure. I'll show you some temperature plots. Thank you. So this, for reference, is um, um, base case solar cycle comparison, and this is just to show. Um, actually, I guess it's that's a little mis misnomer. This is a base case solar minimum solar minimum plots, so that, that title is not quite right. Um, so this is um, solar minimum based case and um, plotted on a um, height altitude scale and also a pressure scale. And the, my, um, the purpose of the pressure scale is um, to try to better understand what, ha um, account for what happens if your whole atmosphere and all of your chemistry is reduced in altitude. So to take that into account or to take that out. Um, so. So um, the reason I put these in was just to show the various different um, types of hydrogen species and at what altitudes which one was dominant. So here, for the solar minimum base case, um, atomic hydrogen becomes dominant at about 130-ish um, kilometers in altitude. Um, and then this black is um, total hydrogen, and by that we've um, Accounted for total hydrogen atoms. Um, oh, I think. Unfortunately, I think that caption was also wrong. I'm sorry. For anybody who's watching that, the caption was wrong. Apologize. Um, so, uh, so these are. Um, this is um, temperatures, and these are. Um, this is solar um, minimum and solar maximum control case temperatures. Um, and then this is on the altitude scale and the um, pressure scale. And one can see that the solar minimum temperatures are, are, as expected, lower than the solar maximum temperatures. And also because if we compare the altitude versus the pressure scales, the, um, we can see that the atmosphere is contracting during the cooler solar minimum conditions. OK, so this is. Um, this is um, a hydrogen distribution for solar um, minimum and maximum. And the hydrogen is, uh, the hydrogen in its density is higher during solar minimum than during solar maximum conditions at thermospheric altitudes. And I think some of those reasons may be the following, and I very much welcome your feedback and input. But one is that the atmosphere is expanding during um, solar maximum. So at these altitudes, the densities will be um, uh, lower because of that atmospheric expansion. Also, the, um, the fluxes, um, the hydrogen fluxes and, and the fluxes through the top of the atmosphere remain relatively constant over the solar cycle pretty much constant in, um, in terms of the model output. And so if the flux is remaining constant and then the speed is decreasing during solar minimum, the densities are increasing to maintain the constant flux. And then also there is a small difference in the model escape rates over the solar cycle. Yes? So what sets that flux value? What sets the flux value? Mm -hmm. yeah, so so in the model, we were looking, we've been looking the last week at the upper boundary. So there are three terms. There is a escape due to genes escape, which, which is um, like related to temperature and density. Then there's escape due to polar wind charge exchange. And 
um, I, that, that in the model is um, just scaled to the genes flux. And then there's a charge exchange flux, too. And um, I don't know that, um, I don't know if it's correct or not in the model. I don't think there have been, uh, um, we don't have a lot of measurements to indicate whether this, this flux should be constant over the solar cycle or not. Oh, the limiting flux. Mm -hmm. um, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we looked at the output from the model, and it's giving um, relative, pretty constant fluxes over the solar cycle for the base case. The, the lower controls the total hydrogen, and. Um, or, well, I think it's actually the in the mesosphere. It's my understanding that this is part of the, the control, and this um, doesn't have a large solar cycle variation. Oh, is that right? <laughs> oh, right. That's Mm -hmm. So, um, cut total hydrogen. And I actually have a plot with the total hydrogen later that we can look at. Thanks. And then this is um, looking at, um, um, this is looking at um, solar, solar, uh, a doubling. So for the next few slides, I'll show um, um, some results from scenarios where we doubled carbon dioxide and methane, but also we doubled water vapor to, at the lower boundary, to approximately double, uh, sorry, to approximately represent doubling of methane. It's, it's still an approximation, but um, the reason for doing this was is because um, much of the oxidation of methane to water vapor occurs below the lower boundary of the global mean model. So much of that oxidation is occurring below 30 kilometers. Um, however, as I mentioned earlier, there is water vapor that's coming up through storm activity. So this is not taking that into account. This is like a semi-approximation of um, methane doubling, um, which we bet like to better um, make more accurate with use of Wacom conditions. But for now, um, we doubled um, carbon dioxide, methane, and water in order to better approximate um, carbon dioxide and methane doubling at the lower boundary. And what I wanted to show is this is the same plot from before, minimum and maximum, but here's also the doubling scenarios for, um, for um, all of these gases at minimum and maximum. And this is on a, um, this is this upper thermosphere plot blown up a little bit more so that we can see it a little bit better. But the um, changes with the doubling is um, less than the, at thermospheric altitudes less than the change with the solar cycle. And I just wanted to emphasize here, these are really sensitivity studies to better understand mechanisms. They're not historical concentrations of greenhouse gases. OK, and then um, this is a, these are looking at, um, the next series of plots will be to look at um, the results from these studies. Um, this is the red curves will be the um, approximate methane doubling. So it's methane and water vapor doubling. And then the blue curve is doubling only of carbon dioxide at the lower boundary and keeping methane and water vapor at their base concentrations. And then the black curve is a doubling of all three. And so first looking at temperature, um, this is solar maximum. Oh, sorry, let's see. OK, and solar minimum. So again, solar maximum and solar minimum. And there's a larger response in the temperature to carbon dioxide cooling at solar minimum than at solar maximum. And then um, here's this, um, the temperature results. The, the green is actually corresponding to the blue. I just started to make the green curves blue for people who are colorblind. But um, for now, unfortunately, the green is, didn't get to finish all of the plots. But these are, um, this is the same um, model runs, but on pressure scale, plotted versus pressure scales. And we can see also here that the, um, 
the temperature has a greater response um, to carbon dioxide at solar minimum than at solar maximum. And here, this is temperature difference, not percent difference, but temperature difference. And also that the, um, the doubling of methane and water vapor has very little effect on the temperature, probably a little bit of um, change at lower altitudes. And then this is, um, these are the same three scenarios for atomic hydrogen. So this is solar maximum and solar minimum. And this is maximum um, and um, minimum. And here I'll say that the solar minimum, we'll look at the other case again too, but this is solar minimum. This is um, um, at solar minimum, well, first, first there's um, a, a solar cycle variation in the um, way that these different scenarios risk, uh, sorry, in the way that hydrogen responds to these different scenarios. So, so that's one conclusion, that there's a solar cycle dependence in um, the response to these various, these three different scenarios. Um, at solar minimum, the response is larger, and um, it appears that um, the shape of the curve is uh, of the distribution is greatly influenced by carbon dioxide, and then the magnitude at upper thermospheric altitudes is um, influenced by both methane and carbon dioxide. Whereas at at um, solar maximum, it's methane is the predominant um, influence on the magnitude of the change with the doubling of carbon dioxide and methane. Because the carbon dioxide has, the thermospheric altitudes has not very much influence on the magnitude, and it's mostly methane. But the shape of the methane response is also different at, at solar minimum than at maximum. Yeah? At the solar side of it, Google model, are you taking solar observations, or do you just look at the oh. Right. That's a great question. No. No, this is, um, this is more of a, um, that's a great follow-up study. This is um, looking at F10.7 of 80 versus 200. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, um, this region would be important to look at for follow-up studies to better understand the, um, the various different partitioning of hydrogen-containing species. Thanks for the question, too. So um, we have an, a number of studies where we're trying to better understand these curves. Again, uh, are these, 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 um, um, this response. One, um, one likely con contributor is that um, because the temperature response at solar minimum is, is larger than at solar maximum, this, um, the um, effect of carbon dioxide cooling may be larger at solar minimum than at, at solar maximum. So that's. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have that. I'll, we'll show you that in just a moment. Yeah, thank you for the question. Did um, Ling or Alan, did you want to add anything more to this here? OK. Um, in a moment, I'll show the total hydrogen. This is um, the three different scenarios again, but plotted on um, pressure scales. And again, to try to see whether is the change that we're seeing, was that just due to um, the whole atmosphere chemistry changing with altitude um, versus at solar minimum versus maximum? So this is on pressure scales. And what we can see here is that there is, again, a solar cycle difference where the um, carbon dioxide, which is a green here, carbon dioxide um, doubling um, appears to have a greater influence on the hydrogen um, at solar minimum than at solar maximum. And um, at solar maximum, it seems that the uh, methane is the predominant, predominant influence on the response to greenhouse gases when you double both methane and carbon dioxide. Okay, and then this is um, Gary's question about total hydrogen. So what we did here is we um, doubled, uh, we tried to track all the hydrogen atoms by um, doubling water vapor, weighting each species by how many hydrogen atoms were in each, were, are in each species. So doubling water vapor, for example, uh, multiplying methane by a factor of four. And um, 
So this is um, solar maximum, and this is um, solar minimum. So we again see a solar cycle dependence in the total hydrogen. Um, there's not as much um, structure down here due to um, the structure I think that we've seen is the change the, the um, different hydrogen species be, um, going into different sorry the transition of hydrogen atoms between hydrogen different hydrogen containing species but this is um, solar maximum again and um, oops sorry solar maximum um, and where we see that uh, the methane uh, sorry, total hydrogen where, where methane um, has a big, uh, bigger effect than um, carbon dioxide in terms of the magnitude at, at thermospheric altitudes. Also, um, one, and then at solar um, minimum, carbon dioxide has a bigger effect than at solar maximum, and the total effect is larger. The total response is larger at solar minimum. Um, one thing to note too is that. Um, at the lower boundary, we've doubled, again, carbon dioxide, sorry, methane, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. So we didn't exactly double all the hydrogen um, atoms because um, we haven't doubled H2 in this scenario, or molecular hydrogen. But um, so the doubling at the lower boundary in terms of the total hydrogen is about 90 percent, but at the upper boundary, I mean, at upper thermosphere, it's only about 60 to 70 percent change. So that's still an unresolved question as to why is the upper boundary not responding in the same way as the lower boundary? Why, if you have, if you increase hydrogen by 90 percent at the lower boundary, why is the total hydrogen not increasing by 90 percent at the top boundary? Um, so another um, study that we've been involved with this last week is um, uh, looking at the upper boundary to just see is it might it be possible that um, that if the upper boundary condition is not correct maybe that's um, producing these results so just to see what what's happening with the upper boundary so here what we did is we changed the um, it, I, I mentioned that there are three terms for the upper boundary. There's the, in the global mean model, that is, there's the um, genes escape, the charge exchange, and the polar wind. So we took the charge exchange, and there's a coefficient in front of the charge exchange, and we halved that just to see what the response would be. And um, these are the density response. The um, lots of lines, but just the dotted lines um, have are the halving scenarios. So the densities are changing. Um, they're a little bit larger when the the um, the charge exchange flux is coefficient is halved. It doesn't mean eventually when the model equilibrates that the charge exchange flux is actually halved, but um, but um, the, the upper boundary is changed. Um, but then um, when we compared um, did, did this comparison study with a base case using that same uh, modified upper boundary, we get very similar results in terms of um, the carbon dioxide and the methane and the doubling response of hydrogen to, the, to these two different scenarios. So here is, um, what, while the distributions are changing, the, um, the um, actual um, percent changes are not changing very much. So again, the dotted lines mean um, are the um, change in upper boundary, and then um, the solid lines are when we use the upper boundary from the model. Okay, and um, this is temperature, and as expected, the um, temperature is not changing due to the um, due to, due to changes in the hydrogen upper boundary. So I was, I was. Um, so some of the follow-up work for, for this part of the study will be to use the, globe, um, the, um, the, WAC, the whole atmospheric community climate model to better represent the lower boundary of the, um, and the lower um, altitudes um, of the global mean model in order to have a more accurate representation of actually what the source species are and how they change with um, more accurate, um, um, actually historical, historical concentration. And I, I don't know if anybody had any questions, but I was next, um, because we had the meeting this morning where people had some questions about um, the James Bishop's model, I was next just going to talk a little bit, just for a couple minutes, about how you might connect um, the observations to the modeling. So I don't know if anyone had questions first, or comments, or suggestions. 
Yeah. Oh, that's, thank you. That's, thank, that's it. That's a, I, I think, a typo. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, though. Um, I guess different versions of emphasis. Maybe that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, um, so um, okay, one of the challenges in, com in, in model validation um, and comparing these um, Fabry Pro measurements um, with the um, with, the, with these um, climate models or, or um, solar cycle models. One of the challenges is that the um, hydrogen emission observations, are, we're looking at a column of emissions, not just at one particular altitude. And that emission depends not only on the density structure, but also on the solar excitation flux, which changes over the solar cycle. So that's a complicating factor. So um, it's not. It's not like a very straightforward process to do the model validation, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how one approach to doing some model validation. So um, this is using a model, um, a radio transfer forward model that was um, developed by our late colleague James Bishop. And um, what he has done is he takes a model thermosphere and extends it into the exosphere using um, a, another model that he created, an analytic model that extends into the exosphere. And um, then it calculates hydrogen emissions that would be observed from the ground or from um, a satellite, for example, the GUVI satellite. And Laura Waldrop and Larry Paxton have been doing a lot of work with this code to try to um, analyze, the solar, uh, analyze the GUVI observations. So, um, so for this code, back, background thermospheric conditions are supplied by a particular model, a various different version of EMSIS various versions, or um, times GCM as an example, or perhaps a global mean model. Um, and then um, you can, um, or what you can do is you can, oh, right, that's the background thermosphere condition, sorry. Um, you can either specify um, the hydrogen distribution um, from a model, or um, the model can calculate a hydrogen distribution using um, a three-parameter model. Um, that provides a modified Chapman profile near and below 110 kilometers, a diffusive flux at higher thermospheric altitudes, and extension to exospheric altitudes. Um, so the peak hydrogen density, the exospheric hydrogen density, and the flux are the three parameters that are used to define the thermosphere. And then the exosphere, there's two additional parameters that can help you determine which part of the um, population of atoms is going on these big satellite trajectories versus going up and coming back down on a ballistic tra trajectory. So um, um, in order to try to do, um, there's a number of different ways of using this code. One way is to try to retrieve these parameters from um, observations. And to do that, um, what one does is you take observations in many different look directions, and you use the observations in many look directions to constrain the forward model to find out which, which of these three parameters will give you the best um, fit to your observations. Multiple, multiple look directions. Multiple look. Yes, at least squares fit. I. Um, I think so. I think so. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. I'll think about that, but I'm pretty sure. Um, so this is, um, this is some work uh, by my colleague um, Ed Merkowitz with James Bishop, where they use ground-based observations and satellite observations to constrain the forward model and to um, produce a range of um, possible hydrogen densities. And this is EMSIS. Um, and um, the exacube is, an, is a, a cube sat, a small satellite that's being built to measure hydrogen and likely a few other species. But um, the, the, the primary goal is hydrogen. Um, and um, hydrogen has never been measured directly, as far as I know, um, from, a small, from a satellite. It's often inferred from charge exchange reactions. So the goal would be that hopefully the execute measurements can help to provide a, a further constraint by actually saying, well, the density at a particular altitude is x. 
and then helping to constrain this range of, of, constri of, of densities. Also, some further modeling with um, finer scale grid spacing may also help to narrow this range. <coughs> Another way that we might use this for um, like the solar cycle comparison, um, this is with EMSIS, NRL EMSIS. What we did was um, we, um, um, in, instead of using this three parameter model, we used an EMSIS thermosphere to, um, as the thermosphere and then extended, uh, used that also as a lower boundary to the exospheric model and then used the radio transfer model to predict what the intensities would be at the ground. And, um, what we see here is that the ten intensities are actually lower um, when you use MSIS extending to the, um, with the Bishop analytic model than um, the actual measured intensity. So the calculated intensities are lower than the um, actual intensities, and these are for nighttime conditions. I'm, yeah, so I'll just say that. This is for nighttime. And I um, just wanted to show these measurements when we're talking about model validation. These are also some measurements by my colleague Ed Merkowitz. And um, these are um, some effective temperature measurements. So um, looking at a column of emissions, but looking at the um, effective temperature by effective temperature, meaning that it's not, that, that there's some non Maxwellian nature to the temperature. But these are measurements. Um, that were taken when the shadow was close to the exabase. So they're more Maxwellian than if you were farther away from the exabase. Um, and so I think um, these kind of measurements could be used for model validation um, for um, just to see if the, the um, variability that's seen, seasonal variability, is also um, present in the model. Um, so um, to conclude, that um, we do see a solar cycle variation in the observations that um, is also corroborated in the older observations by a suggestion of a solar cycle variation. Um, that um, the sensitivity studies with the modeling suggest that there's a solar cycle dependence or maybe preconditioning in the response of hydrogen to um, changes in greenhouse gases. And that um, carbon dioxide cooling as well as the methane appears to have a significant influence in defining the hydrogen distribution at thermospheric altitudes, especially at solar min minimum or particularly at solar minimum. I think the past, the assumption was that it was um, methane was mainly the driver for affecting the um, hydrogen response. Um, and then an unresolved question, oh, the response of hydrogen due to carbon dioxide cooling might be similar to the um, solar minimum versus maximum response and the cooling at solar minimum versus maximum um, and its effect on hydrogen distributions and an unresolved question is why the change in total hydrogen in the upper thermosphere is smaller compared with the change at the lower boundary and I think that might involve doing some um, tracking of different terms and um, what's happening to production and loss for hydrogen containing species and then an estimate would be that um, because the solar cycle response is predicted to be um, greater than that due to greenhouse gas doubling, and because our measurements are um, over a much, much shorter range, uh, um, carbon dioxide has not doubled, methane has doubled since pre more than doubled since prehistoric times, but the changes over the time scale of our observations are so much smaller that um, that, that suggests that if there is, an, uh, the, in the apparent upward trend in the observations, if that persists after the reanalysis, that that upward trend would be larger than would be expected response. But we'll need to do more forward modeling to make that a more quantitative statement. And some of the ongoing and future work are to um, this reanalysis of the mid-latitude H emission, hydrogen emission data set to reduce uncertainties and to better link the older and newer observations together. Um, sensitivity studies to investigate the hyd hydrogen source species in the stratosphere and mesosphere, um, additional upper boundary sensitivity studies, um, and then want to use the Times GCM to repeat some of these studies because um, the Times GCM will include the dynamics, which are not present in the global average model, um, and also diurnal and geographic influences. And then use of the whole atmosphere community climate model to specify more ro realistic lower boundary conditions for the lower for the global mean model and maybe lower um, thir lower um, some of the profiles at lower altitudes in the global mean model as well. And then also use Wacom 
to investigate some of the lower upper atmospheric coupling of hydrogen budgets and distributions. And like one question I have is, and I don't know the, at all the answer to this question is, if um, if there's an perhaps not fully explained um, change in water vapor in the stratosphere, is there any relation to hydrogen in the upper atmosphere? Um, and then forward modeling to compare observations with model predictions. And thank you so much for coming and for um, you know um, enabling me to be a visitor again here. And um, thank you so much again to Li Ying and Alan in particular to be able to work with you on these problems. And thank you, Rebecca, for um, organizing the talk. Oh, and thank you to Ben, too, for all the help he gives me. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. How often do you take those? Oh, how often have they been taken? It varies depending on, on and, I, and I haven't, I have taken some in the past, but not personally taking them at this time. So um, um, most of, it, it varies depending on what kind of campaigns are going on and um, also, the um, most of the many of the observations that we use for these studies are taken in the winter because the observing conditions are better, and the the you have you can't take observations when the moon is up because you see the effect of of solar um, reflection off the off the moon, and it has to be nighttime and it has to be very clear skies. So so it depends. Um, like. Um, uh, some years it'll be every clear, almost every clear night, the, the WAM instrument was taking observations. And in other years, sometimes they were observing other lines. So that, I don't know if that partially addresses the question. Oh, great question, too. There have, there, thank you. Because there are other, um, there are other observations being taken at the Arecibo Observatory, too. So, and there have been some, measurements um, during past times taken with a photometer, I believe, and a spectrometer at the Abbas Tsunami Observatory in Tbilisi, near Tbilisi, Georgia. But not so, not so many observations. That's also um, an advantage of the GUVI data as well, to have more um, global coverage, too. Yes? Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk with you more about that, too, and how, um, um, so I'll talk with you more, yes. And I also would point you to Laura Waldrop, too, and her work, because she's been um, using the code to look at the Gooby observations, but I'd like to hear more. Thank you. Assumptions do you make about the uh, terrain shape? Are not yeah. No, no. No, that's a big. 
source of uncertainty. Um, um, so the yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I I can give you some oh. calculations and make that outline and add to it an uh, outline profile. Oh, wonderful. I, uh, there were coupons and uh, variations in the type of test, and I shall make the conversion of the two uh, uh, Oh, fantastic! So wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, the other thing is I looked at some uh, long time ago some uh, SLM UBSD data in which you could see the actually results of your corona lab process. And you had the required if there were uh, observation of the particular genome handle. So you could try to measure it, you could model that. And as I recall that was about Oh, mm -hmm. um, and was that a, is that a temperature at a particular altitude or over a range of altitudes? Well, around very close to the satellite orbit. Mm -hmm. And it might, it's, it could, oh, the temperature was 1600. It, I guess it could be due to these um, effective temperatures being over a column of emissions that also include thermospheric emissions. But, um, but I'm very interested in talking with you more. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. No, no, thank you so much. be interesting to see too. Um, and we've, we have used some SOHO data for solar minimum and then um, another value for maximum. This is very hard because in the UV, very is it, did they not measure? You don't measure it because it's so hot, so difficult to measure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, everybody. That was very nice.